All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google here in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Webmaster Office Hour Hangouts, where people can join in and ask their questions around their website and web search. And we try to find some answers or make sure that we pass some feedback on to the team here as well. Um, I, I hope you're all doing well and uh, that you're enjoying summer if you're in, in an area where you have summer at the moment, um, or I guess fall or winter if you're in the southern hemisphere. Um, I, I hope you all find some time to take off in between as well, uh, despite all of the crazy situations around coronavirus. A uh, bunch of stuff was submitted already, but if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're you're welcome to join in and jump in now. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, maybe you remember that in the last uh, webmaster, I asked you about the problem of Favicon uh, that uh, disappeared uh, since uh, or. Now it's three months, and uh, I was suspecting uh, that was uh, related to the site uh, uh, not being indexed in the root because uh, no subdomain for each language. And mm -hmm. you told me to wait uh, still a couple of weeks to see if something changed, and I waited, but uh, nothing happened. So still uh, Favicon not showing. Now it's about three months, so maybe there is something weird. Maybe I can. Uh, Drop the, the site uh, in the sure. chat. Yeah, if so, if you can drop it into the chat, I'm I'm happy to pass that on to to the team to double check. Here, yeah. here it is because I, I don't know if it's I mean if it can be related because I double check that uh, the, the guidelines of uh, Google uh, should be followed. You know the the dimension of the icon. Uh, I think it's uh, fine, and so after. Uh, so long, uh, it's strange because I think that the, the Favicon can input the uh, click to rate. No, I imagine it because people maybe it's more likely to, to click on, on an, uh, an icon instead of the, the generic uh, word uh, icon. Maybe I don't know. I, I think that would be hard to, to see if, if that's directly the case. I think. It probably helps people, especially those that understand the site already. But I, I don't think it would change much in, in behavior for kind of generic users that don't know your site yet. But still, like reg regardless of what, what exactly okay. it would change, it seems okay. like this is something that we should be able to fix on our side. OK, I, I put it on the chat. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I saw you also mention kind of like what the problem is. That makes it a lot easier because I get the chat transcript afterwards, and sometimes I have to puzzle which which site was what. But like that's perfect. Okay, thanks. Hey John, how are you? Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, my question is regarding something uh, which is called entity corrosion. Uh, like. Uh, if you search for something like mobile games or video games, Google shows us a corrosion at the top in SARP. So, like, what we can do, or are the like how we can optimize to be there, or how Google pick these entities, and is there some something that we can do to optimize our website or to improve our chances being in there? It essentially, it tries to understand the the entities on the page directly. So it's not that you have to do any special kind of markup or do anything specific on your pages, uh, but more that we, we understand that this is kind of an entity that is talked about on the web in general uh, and is not something that's like just limited to your specific website. Uh, so in practice, that means we when we crawl and index the, the whole web, we find a lot of these items. We can recognize that it's. They're talking about the same entity. Uh, they have same information. And then based on that, we can try to figure out where this entity fits in with the, the rest of the web. But it's not that you need to do any, any special kind of markup or kind of add code to your pages for that. OK, so it's basically about the signals that Google collects from different sources. Yeah, yeah. 
it's uh, from from information that we we recognize from from across the web because it's it's important to us to understand that this is not something that's unique to one particular site, but rather like other people understand that this is an entity, and based on that, we can say, well, we we should treat it as an entity as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey. Hey, John. Hi. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Uh, John, I have a question regarding the uh, URL inspection tool. Are there any sort of crawling issues at the current time, especially with new sites? Um, not, not that I'm aware of. I, I know that sometimes we, we have fluctuations in our pipelines that things get a little bit slow, and sometimes that ends up being visible in the URL inspection tool. But I'm not aware of anything broader that's kind of blocked there. Are you seeing specific problems at, at the moment, or? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, the new sites that we're working on. We've seen it 10 times. OK, so you're submitting the, the home page for indexing, essentially, or? No, it's not getting in there. Yeah. Um, hard to say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say. But I, I think the important part also with, with these tools, especially when you're submitting things to indexing, is that we, we just don't index all content that we see. And uh, sometimes we th see things in the URL inspection tool, and our system's like, oh, we don't know if we need to index this right away. Uh, but the more signals that we have about content, the more likely we end up going there and, and trying to get it indexed as well. So especially if you're seeing things like new sites not being indexed immediately, then I would tend to give it a little bit more time and maybe try to work on, on other ways to make that site known, uh, which could, could be a variety of different things, I guess, like working with the sitemap file, uh, making sure that everything is lined up properly from a technical point of view, th those kind of things. Yeah, boy, it's, like it's, it's like a crawling issue or an indexing issue. We submitted. Nothing happens in the search console, uh, including the search results. You know. uh, yeah. I think we've, uh, we've tried this for multiple sites, but it's not working out. No. I, I don't know. It's hard, hard to say. I'm, I'm not aware of anything that would mean right. that that's right. blocked right. completely. I think. If, if that were the case, then we would see a lot of complaints on, on Twitter and in the forums. Uh, so it, it might just be something temporary that, that you should try it again a little bit later. Um, if, if you're seeing this regularly happening, then I just recommend starting a thread in the forum together with your URL uh, so that folks there can double check to see if, if things are kind of aligned with regards to crawling and. Uh, try try with their own tools, or maybe they have general feedback for the site overall. Sure, thank you very much. Sure. All right. Any last questions before we jump into the submitted ones? I have a question, John. Hi. Sure. Um, so I actually I have two questions actually. Um, so my first question is. Um, Recently, when I start, when I Google my brand name um, on the first or second page of the results, there's a site review website um, that pops up, and it has the rich result snippet with the, the rating and stuff, and it's just a lot of um, user submitted reviews about the website. Um, and I'm I'm not sure what impact this actually has, whether directly or you know, I suppose there would be an indirect impact if a user sees. Uh, the reviews, and they are looking for reviews about the website. So um, I know there is that aspect of it, but I was wondering if there is any other sort of aspect um, or any sort of other impact um, on my site based on you know links that are maybe shared in the reviews, or um, I know BERT can sometimes be used to like kind of understand context of a page. So you know if there's a uh, is if there's a neg negative sentiment um, generally on the page, could that have any sort of impact on 
um, the performance or ranking of my website. I, I don't think you'd see any effect on, on the ranking of your website from that. I, mm -hmm. I think at, at most, what, what might happen is that people stumble across that in the search results for your company name. They're like, oh, well, what does this mean? And then they get lost in that website, kind of. But uh, it's not that the existence of such a page would negatively affect your site. Uh, even if there are some negative reviews on there, I mean, on, on the internet, there, there are all kinds of things. Um, sure. So that's something where. I wouldn't directly assume that that would have a negative impact. Um, okay. Sometimes it makes sense to try to create other kinds of content that go up, especially for things like, like a query for your company name. Um, but it's, it's always a question of where you invest your time. If people are already searching for your company name, they, they kind of know where to go anyway. So mm -hmm. it's. I don't know. It's not, not always straightforward to say, like, oh, you should create more pages with your company name on it just so that you can cover the whole search results with your favorable content. Right. OK. So basically, don't need to worry about that too much. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't worry okay. about it. OK, good. Um, and then I had a, another question. Um, it was, yeah, OK, so uh, my website has a forum. It's located on a subdomain um, of the main property, so it's not part of the same domain, but um, and uh, it's 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 a really old form. So there's like there's I think uh, over a hundred thousand users, and um, I'm realizing recently that uh, a lot of these users, maybe more than ninety percent of them, um, are very new, and they're 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 using the they're abusing the user profiles um, for link building schemes essentially, and um, I'm wondering what like what this could do to my sub, whether the, the subdomain, um, sorry, the, the, the forum, or if like, you know, whether it could affect my main site at all. Um, and I know like the subdomain is sort of seen differently from the main site, but it links, um, I, I would say it links pretty well to the main site. Like uh, we have the nav menu that goes to all the main categories on the main site. And it's, um, a lot of the uh, users submitted content. A lot of the posts and stuff will also include links to the main site. So, um, you know, sh should I? There's there's a lot of pages. So I'm wondering, should I go in and clean up all those links, remove all those user profiles, and if so, what's the best way to handle that? No follow, no. Yeah, I, I think no follow is is definitely the the first step I would take there, especially okay. if you're unsure about those profiles and people are using them for link building then making sure that those pages have no follow on them sometimes makes it less interesting for people to kind of abuse the forum for that. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of the, the first thing I would take there. But I would also try to see if you can find ways to kind of algorithmically recognize this kind of abuse and spammy content and no index it by default. Uh, so that that might be something where if you can tell that a user has been around for a certain period of time or they've contributed positively to the forum, then make their profile indexable and otherwise keep it no index. Uh, these kind of things because it's uh, on the one hand the the links can can have an effect there that our algorithms might look at this and say. If, if we can isolate those profiles, then we can just ignore those links. If we can't isolate the profiles, which, which is often the case, then maybe we'll be ignoring all of the links from the forum. And if this is on a subdomain, then it might be that our algorithms are not able to completely understand the relationship between the subdomain and the main domain, and they ignore all of the links across the whole domain. Uh, so that's yeah. something where I try to clean that up as much as possible. Um, it's probably something where you don't see an urgent or critical change if you make that cleanup, but it, it would have kind of a longer term effect. When we, if we can really understand this is good content and this is what you want to have published and it's tied to your other website, which is also really good content, then that helps us a lot more versus if we understand, well, this website is OK and this one is filled with spam, and it's like, they're, they're connected, so should they kind of be forwarding signals back and forth, or should they be completely separated from our side? It's hard to say. OK. But so just to confirm, there, so you're saying there is a risk that um, the main site's links could be seen as spammy as well because of 
the sort of all, a lot of spam on the subdomain? Yeah, it's it's not so much that we would see them as spammy, but our okay. algorithms could learn to ignore those links. And essentially that that's something that that automatically happens. We we see a lot of user generated links on a site and we think, well, probably the the webmaster isn't aware of what's actually happening here. We'll just ignore these to kind of be on the safe side. And mm -hmm. that might end up with us ignoring the other links on your site as well, which is probably not what you want. Right, yeah. OK, and then um, the other thing is I, a lot of these profiles, I notice that um, they're, our most back, they're amongst our most backlinked pages. So they're getting like hundreds of thousands of, on, on top of hundreds of thousands of backlinks from very low quality, you know, more spammy type of sites um, from the people who put the links in the user profiles clearly buying the links or something. So, um, you know, is that something to be worried about? Should I disavow those links? Should I just leave them? I, I don't think you really need to do anything there. If you no index okay. those profile pages in the end, then that all kind of disappears anyway. Um, but that's that's really popular tactic. And a lot of times, that's just completely automated, that people will drop links here, and they see they're not no followed. Therefore, they'll start building links to those profile pages. And uh, a lot of times, that's just some scripts that keep running forever. Uh, okay. So it's not. I, I wouldn't say it's something that you need to urgently worry about, because we, we see that all the time as well. And we can usually deal with that fairly well. OK, so adding no follow and no index to those pages, I wouldn't then need to disavow the, the, no. back, the backlinks themselves. No. Okay. no. Okay. And they will, if I no index them, they sh those backlinks should just disappear on their own over time? Or will they that kind of always be there? I, I imagine they they will remain for a while, even after they yeah. drop out of the index. But uh, essentially, they they wouldn't have any effect there. Especially if the pages are no followed, then they they essentially stay there and they don't get forward to the rest of the site. And it's also something where I don't think you would be seeing any positive effect from those backlinks. So it's not that you have to worry about causing a problem by cleaning up the spam. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But John, Sounds like just, a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Baruch? John, uh, follow up to that, because you, you also mentioned that there's some low quality sites that are good. Like, I don't know, uh, people have this whole DA thing and this thing, you know. There are sites that, low quality ones that you were mentioning in a Twitter feed that are OK, right? Like startups, for instance. Or... Oh, OK. Oh, I, I see what you mean. So if, if it's just like random sites linking to your site, yeah, yeah, that's that's usually less of a problem. Yeah. A so just because it's it's a site that is less known doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's a problematic site. Right. But in, in the case of the, these kind of profile links, that's something where these automated tools essentially build link networks across all of these user-generated sites and try to promote their stuff that way. And mm -hmm. that's something where I'd say it's not like uh, low quality links. It's just pure spam that we can essentially ignore. But in her case, if she wants to really clean it up, she can build like an AI tool and then kind of filter out the, you know, explicit words or you know, give away yeah. bad maybe to. Uh, yeah. Users are I, I, I think it's, it's possible to do a lot of things, but probably just taking a really rough approach and saying, using something really simple, like, has, has this user contributed multiple times to the forum over the course of maybe a couple of months, that automatically catches all of those really basic spam bots. So that's something where. Like I don't think you need to do anything really fancy, magical. Uh, it's it's something that's probably fairly easy to implement. So moving forward, disavowing pretty much that's it. Like there's no need because your algorithm just uh, is very good at it. I I think for for these kind of things, I I definitely wouldn't worry about disavow because the these are all similarly kind of affected user generated content sites and. That's something we, we've seen since, I don't know, the, before I joined Google. It's like those bots have been around, those scripts have been around, dropping links in forums and profile pages. 
uh, we we have a lot of practice with that. But it's it's something where we we can try to get it as much as possible. But if you can take care of it by cleaning it up on your side and preventing it in the first place, that's always a much better solution. So. Uh, a jump follow up on uh, the, the link uh, backlink quality things. Um, we, we know that uh, if there's a page that's high authority, then have a lot of backlink to link that page and that link to my website's uh, pages. They will pass link juice and uh, page authority. So my question here is that uh, you know that how page link work is um, is uh, largely based on what those uh, 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 source pages backlink that pay, passing link juice to me. But uh, in, in the situation that, let's, just, let's say that there is a page, um, let's say um, the other website, and they, 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 they have very great content, and they write, uh, for example, they talk about breast cancer and write a very good con uh, content about that. They have zero backlink, and they rank very well perform very well, and that page linked to my article about breast cancer too. So it's very semantical related, and they rank very well, perform very well, but they don't have any backlink. Would that link, uh, will that link benefit my page? I, I think if people are linking naturally to your site, then I wouldn't worry about if they benefit your page or not. Um, if, if people are, like recommending your site as a good resource, that's that's always a good thing. So I I wouldn't worry too much about if like how much value I'm getting out of this random link that someone has added, uh, because you can't really control that yourself anyway. Yeah, I understand yeah. what are you saying. Uh, what I want to uh, actually ask about this question is that we know that uh, backlink is highly concentrated on the uh, source pages backlink. But do source pages content also also uh, participate in the algorithm of the backlink quality? I don't quite follow. So, it, uh, how do you mean? So 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 we know that a backlink is sellable when the source page has backlink, right? We all know that. But is the source page quality also um, play a role here? I I think that always plays a little bit of a role. I I think. It is very easy to try to isolate links and just focus on page rank and things like that. Uh, but page rank is, is just one really small part of the, the bigger Google algorithm. And when we see recommendations from other websites, we, we try to understand what, what that recommendation means. Uh, how, how is that website kind of interacting with the rest of the web? What are the anchor texts involved? What is the text around those links? All of that plays a little bit of a role with regards to understanding how, how this page should be treated. So it's, it's something where it's easy to go in and say, well, this link counts so much page rank, uh, and that's what I want. But there's always just so much more than just pure page rank out there. I see. Thank you so much. Sure. OK, uh, let me run through some of the submitted questions so that we don't lose track of them completely. Uh, it's totally awesome to see so many active people here in, in the Hangout, though. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there any impact on COVID-19 on the visibility in event schema rich results? Uh, we have an event discovery platform. We've been consi getting consistent visibility for our events and rich results for many years. Uh, in March, it suddenly went to near zero. We were not able to correlate this with any Google public announcements, tried to post on Webmaster Forum, but that hasn't helped. Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure if, if we made any changes with regards to events, but I have heard something similar from, from other folks as well. Uh, uh, in... Hi, John. I, I'm here via, uh, behalf of uh, Richard Potter. I'm Vijay. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. How are you? Cool. OK, your question. Awesome. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure if anything particular happened there, but I have heard something similar from uh, uh, We have implemented uh, online uh, attending mode uh, changes in our uh, uh, reach, uh, I mean, schemas and all. But I don't think there's uh, effect uh, broadly like this. Uh, we 
consistently we uh, got uh, one lakh or uh, one point i mean more than one lakh visits per day through event rich uh, research so my question is uh, uh, this happen you know suddenly yeah so is there any reason or something else my my feeling is we shifted essentially most events over to kind of the online events and that's something that we started yeah. showing a little bit more but i don't know what what the general plans are here or if this is something that might be different from region to region uh, uh it's really hard to say i have tried uh, for open uh, event schema is results and type my uh, you know brand name all events uh, so uh, still my events are not uh, showing there so is there any uh, uh, blocking uh, from your side i don't know if if we have anything specific <laughs> kind of holding back events at the moment i my my feeling is that it's something that we we're essentially trying to do organically now um but i i don't know if there's anything specific happening there i i haven't heard from other people who run events with regards to event markup uh recently about this so it's hard to say but i think in in the webmaster forum you also included your your site's url is that correct ha huh, yes and uh, my second question is uh, i have asked in the webmaster forum so some seo experts are uh, suggest me uh, work, uh, workshop events are not uh, actually events uh, it's business promotion so is this uh, right or not workshop a uh, workshop i don't know depending on how how you frame it I, because, I, uh, think I do see sometimes that people frame things as events that are not actually events. Uh, if it's something, for instance, like an, an online course that you have or a sale mm -hmm. that is currently taking place, uh, then that's something we wouldn't see as an event. Uh, uh, this, uh, this type of workshop uh, we already mark as a, a blog through robots and no index, no follow. Okay. But still, I have a question if uh, there is any genuine workshop. So still, this uh, workshop are count as a promotion or something like that? If if it's blocked by robots text or no index, then we wouldn't index it. So I would no, no, no. My, my question is uh, low quality workshop are uh, uh, no index by our side. But quality was, I, I mean, quality uh, workshop are uh count as promotions or not i i think it depends on how you frame the workshop i i don't think like i because uh, I every com that. every uh yeah because every competitor are using this workshop event right 10 times everyone yeah <laughs> so i i would not focus on what the competitors are doing and just because especially if you know that this is something that you shouldn't be doing then I wouldn't just copy what the competitors are doing because it's essentially not not really going to pro help your website in the long run. So no, I I I, I just ask you. Everybody is doing workshop and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I I think for for these kind of questions where we are not sure if this is the right markup for that, then that's something I I would definitely post in the webmaster help forum. Uh, because the folks there have seen a lot of kind of edge cases where they realize this is maybe problematic, maybe not problematic. So what's your suggestion? What can I do for get my traffic back? Um, I think get your traffic back is, is seems like a different question than the kind of rich results in, in the search. If you're talking about getting traffic or rankings back, then that feels like something where you'd need to work on the website overall rather than just focusing on the rich results types. OK, cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Yep. Um, OK, uh, we added the no site links search box tag on our homepage for over two months, uh, and but we still see the site links search box in the search results. Uh, what's up with that? 
I don't know. Uh, if you can send me the URL, um, either dropping it as a comment in the, the YouTube comments there or send me a note maybe on Twitter, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at that with the team. Uh, usually, the site link search box settings do take a little bit longer to be updated, but over two months seems a little bit long. Uh, we're planning to launch a microsite. Which do you prefer, subdomain or subdirectory? Uh, if you say subdomain, should I have to create a separate sitemap, or can I use the same sitemap of the main domain? Uh, and finally, what are some things to be considered when creating a microsite? Uh, so from, from our point of view, you can use either subdomain or subdirectory. I, I realize there is a lot of contention in the SEO sphere about subdirectories and subdomains. Uh, but essentially, either, either one of those would work from our side. Um, I, I think in practice, I would try to use a subdirectory for this kind of thing, because it sounds like you're trying to create a new view of your existing content. It's not that you're trying to create something completely separate, uh, but essentially it's, it's like a landing page or maybe a handful of landing pages that are connected for a specific product that you're already selling or a service that you're providing on your main domain already then I would just try to tie that in with your main website. Uh, the advantages that you have there is that from a technical point of view, everything is a lot easier. You can use your CMS and just create a bunch of subdirectories and pages, and you're done. Uh, whereas if you create a subdomain, then you suddenly have a separate host name that you have to maintain, or you have to watch out for things like redirects. Uh, you have to verify it separately in Search Console. If you're not doing domain verification, you have to watch out for sitemap files. All of these kind of extra hassles that are involved with, with a subdomain if you're essentially creating something that's essentially part of your main domain. If this is something that's completely separate from your main domain, then maybe a subdomain is a good approach. Maybe even a separate domain is a good approach. Um, maybe still a subdirectory is also fine. Uh, but if like the way you frame it here as a microsite for something that probably you're already doing in some way, I, I would definitely go for a subdirectory and keep it as, as easy as possible, make it easy for you to maintain, make it easy for you to migrate uh, should you need to make changes over time. That's, that's kind of what I would focus on there. Sean, I have a follow-up uh, on that if you have time for it. Sure. Um, I would, so like, where would you draw the line between something that is separate from the main site and something that is still similar to the main site? Like, if I'm doing the same thing, but I'm, I'm so this is for publishing. So if I'm doing the same thing, I'm just publishing more articles, but it is um, on a topic that may not be the it's it's like related, but it's not. Uh, it's not quite the same thing. Um, and I'm thinking maybe there would be different audiences for the new thing um, than for the existing content. Like, is that is that kind of where I would I should do a subdomain instead of a subdirectory? Yeah. I I think the the situation that you mentioned in the beginning where you had a forum and kind of the main website, I think that's that's a perfect situation for something like a subdomain. Uh, because those are clearly kind of separate entities or separate items that you're kind of maintaining, the people going to the forum might not be the ones that go to your main site. And similarly, the ones going to your main site might not be the ones that would go to your forum as well. So that's yeah. that's kind of, I, I think, an, an optimal situation for something like a subdomain. Also, from a technical point of view, it, it's a lot easier to maintain because they're completely separate backends involved, all of that. Uh, if you're just publishing content, I, yeah. I think for the most part, I would just keep it on the main domain. Uh, if it's just okay. informational content, just I, I try to keep it as, as simple as possible. Uh, if you have things like, I don't know, consumer facing side of an e-commerce site and then a dealer login, maybe that dealer login section would be a separate login or a separate subdomain. Um, but like even there, sometimes from a content point of view, it makes sense to keep it all on one site. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think if if it's really just about different types of content and not different functionality, I'd try to keep it together on one one site. Okay, 
like even if I have like sports and then um, I don't know po politics, like kind of, <laughs> it would be um, you know like it would still be okay to have yeah. one site. Okay. Yeah, I I, th I think that still makes sense. Um, because okay. then you can kind of build up that combined site overall over time, and uh, that kind of gains value as, as a bigger group. Whereas if you split things up into subdomains, right. then it's like you have these small islands that are somewhat connected, but more loosely connected rather than tightly connected to your main site. Okay, I'm asking this because I read the um, How Google News Works document, and there was a line in there about. Um, the audience and how uh, an audience that uh, turns to the site for one topic um, that could pass off like an authority signal for that site, uh, like I guess being authoritative or being an expert in that topic because so much of the users who are interested in that topic, I guess, rely on the site or trust the site. So that's kind of where I'm getting uh, like if the audience is, if I'm publishing a lot of different topics on one big site and I have kind of audiences very fragmented, like is that something that could maybe disadvantage my site overall? So I don't know about Google News. I, I don't know if they, okay. they do something special there. But in general, from a web search point of view, I, I don't see a big problem there. Uh, the, the one place where I would watch out for this is if you have a mix of adult content and kind of general content then that's right. something where our safe search algorithms might have trouble understanding where the separation is. And then putting it on a separate subdomain makes it a lot easier to say, this is the content that can be filtered by safe search, and this is the general content. That's, that's a lot easier. But kind of different themes like sports and politics, I, I don't think, for, for the most part, it would make sense to separate that out into separate subdomains. OK, perfect. Thank you. John, can I ask another question? If you sure. Have All right. So I have a follow-up on that about the safe search part. Uh, let's say in a case um, that you have from that you get a lot of spammy links using porn-related anchor tags. And we are seeing some scenarios that people are actually coming to our sites and writing down our comment section, you know, adulty words. And, and they're also sending links using you know, um, and is there any way that it's going to harm us in long way? Uh, because we know, you know, uh, based on documents, safe search filter is supposed to be on URL basis. But are there any sort of, I don't know, domain-wide uh, algorithms that might affect the whole site? Yeah. So in particular, when, when it comes to things like safe search, we try to be as fine-grained as possible with, with the way that we deal with this. Uh, but it's not always possible. So it's something where if we can't isolate the, the part of the site uh, fairly easily automatically, then we, we quickly end up in a situation where we say, well, safe search applies to the whole domain. Uh, so that's something I, I would definitely watch out for with regards to people writing things as comments on your website. Uh, keep in mind, we, we do try to understand which parts of the website have comments and which parts of the pages have comments and try to understand that. But ultimately, the content that you're publishing includes these comments. So if you don't want your website to be found for things like that, or if you don't think that these comments are providing value to your website, then that's something I, I would take action on. Because ultimately, it's your website. And if other people are contributing content to your website and you're saying, oh, this is fine, then you, you will have to kind of in, live with the situation that search engines think, well, this is a part of what you want to stand for on the web. And maybe we will send you traffic for these comments. Or maybe we will look at the, this content and say, oh, this is kind of gibberish. Uh, we don't know what to do with this website overall. So that's something where I wouldn't completely ignore random user-generated content on your website, kind of the comments that you get like that. Um, obviously, it's hard to draw a line and say, well, I will approve manually every comment that is made on a website. If you have tons of comments, then that's essentially impossible to do. Uh, but you can kind of work to figure out what kind of comments are useful, 
Um, maybe let users flag comments so that you can manually review those, or maybe have something like a bad word list that you try to use in a simple way to figure out, are these comments actually useful, or is this maybe something I don't want to have published on my site? Uh, the no index work in this case. Uh, the no index those pages. Will, will this work? Sure. I mean, if you no index those pages, that's kind of a big hammer because then the whole page is gone. Uh, but uh, if it's if it's no index, then we don't use that for indexing. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Some more questions. Uh, most of the important questions answered by Matt are a decade old, and a lot has changed since then. Is it possible to have them answered again? Um, sure. I I mean, we've been recording lots and lots of videos, so I'm happy to to answer more questions. Uh, but like, let us know what what kind of videos you think would profit from a modern take, because we. We have gone through a lot of those older videos from Matt, and a lot of the things they they still stand. Like there are lots of timeless answers there with regards to how you can improve things for your website, uh, particularly around search. And a lot of these things don't change that that much over time. Uh, so just because something is old isn't really a reason for us to say we need to delete it and uh, do it again, because. Like having a fresh face on, on a video makes things so much better. I, I think Matt did a fantastic job with a, a lot of these videos. Uh, but like, like I said, if you run across any that you think definitely need to be replaced or definitely need to be taken down because they're no longer relevant, by all means, let us know. Uh, are rich results from the structured data markup always on the first page of the search results, or can they be shown beyond the first page? Uh, they can definitely be shown beyond the first page. Uh, that's something that's not tied to the first page of the search results. Uh, some particular kinds of elements in the search results are sometimes more visible on the first page, but uh, they're like all the different rich results types, as far as I know, can be shown on any page in the search results. Hey, hey, Sean. Uh, follow up on that. That's my question. So, uh, a, a lot of time I see that there's a uh, we go to a GSC, a Google Search Console. They they have uh, I see something like uh, they they have rich result, but it's have that's in that's in like fifty position or something, but they have very high impression. Uh, like like an impression look like it's on the first page. So, what that mean in GSC? I, I think that's really confusing sometimes. And I, I don't know what it means in, in your particular case. But the, the tricky part with the search results page is it's not just like those 10 links below each other anymore. Uh, we, we have all of those one boxes and sidebars and different uh, navigational elements on a page uh, where it's easy possible that you have maybe 20, 30, maybe even some cases, 50 links that are shown on, on one search results page. And they will all see impressions. Uh, they, they will have kind of the position number in, in Search Console. And uh, that can sometimes look a little bit confusing. So sometimes we see it that it looks like something is on the first page, even though it's position, I don't know, 20 or 30 or 40. Uh, sometimes we see things that we say, oh, this is position number two. And you look at the page, and it's like, where is my website? It's not showing up at all. And it ends up being maybe one of those images in a thumbnail on top, uh, which for, for Webmaster is like, well, technically, it's a link to my website. But practically, it's not as visible as a big text block. Uh, so it's, it's sometimes tricky to, I guess, to uh, understand what, what is shown in, in that search performance report. And this is something where you also see differences across different kind of ranking checking tools, if you use anything like that, um, because everyone has a different opinion on how you should count the position uh, on a page. And I, I don't know what, what the final answer there will be, but it's, it's also something that we we're looking at from time to time to see how can we make that position number a little bit more useful to, for people so that they understand what what does this number actually mean? Is my site like visible? Is it very visible or just slightly visible on a page? 
um, it's it's sometimes hard to judge. Thank you so John, much. Do you know if, um, do you know if uh, so sometimes you, there's a knowledge panel at the top of the, I'm talking about mobile search results where you, you kind of go through tabs to access the content. Um, so, and sometimes you, let's say, flip to a news tab or interesting finds or something, and then there's a load more. So if you're in, if you only rank after you hit the load more, does that still count as, you know, average position one or whatever the uh, actual knowledge panel's position is in Search Console? Um, that's only counted when people see your site in the search results. So it's not, well, not when they see your site, but rather when your site is loaded with a link in that search results page. Uh, so if you have to click the Load More button in order for kind of the next part of the links to be shown, then that wouldn't count as the first page. Uh, that okay. would only count when someone actually clicks on that. OK, so the position would be much lower, or would it not? Uh, how would that appear, I guess? It would it would be higher. It's kind of like going to page two. OK. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, what are the recommendations from Google for indexing and ranking audio? Nowadays, some publishers produce audio just have two main ways to index and rank this content, Google Podcast or embed it in a news article surrounded by text. Uh, what are some options? Are there any plans to give more visibility to audio in the search results? So I can't say much about the plans. Uh, on the one hand, I'm not aware of anything specific being planned there. Uh, but we also generally try not to pre-announce things. Uh, with regards to audio in general, um, the, I think the best approach is really just to, to work with transcripts, and to, to especially if you're doing something like a podcast where people are talking, then if you have a transcript, then that's something we can look at and see from a web search point of view. Here's a bunch of text. Uh, we can rank this page based on this text. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main approach I would take there. Um, it's something where I imagine at some point in the future we'll be able to go in there and do kind of voice understanding of what is being said and index the, the audio content based on that. But I don't think that will happen within the next couple of weeks or anything like that. So uh, making sure you have a transcript, text, together with your, the links to your audio files, that's probably what, what I would aim for. Uh, the structured data testing tool will be greatly missed. Are there any plans to expand the scope of the rich results testing tool? Um, yeah. I. I know lots, lots of people have been very vocal about uh, wanting the structured data testing tool to remain. Uh, I think it's something from, from a technical point of view, it makes sense for the team to focus on one tool rather than two tools. Uh, and one of the, the pieces of feedback we've received with structured data in general is that it's sometimes hard for people to understand which types of structured data actually have an effect in search. And that's why we focus on the rich results tool, which focuses on the things that we would show as Google in the search results. So that's kind of the, the background there. Uh, we are planning on expanding the rich results testing tool. We, we've been looking at all the feedback that we're getting, where people are like, oh, this is like terrible, Google, because this one use case I have only works in the structured data testing tool. And we try to take that kind of feedback, understand what it is that people are trying to do, and to make sure that we can implement that with the rich results testing tool. Uh, also, the structured data test is not going away like just now. So it's not that you urgently have to jump over. Uh, but by all means, make sure to send us feedback if there's something specific that you will miss if the structured data testing tool goes away. And try to make that feedback as, as actionable and as understandable as possible. Uh, sometimes we just get feedback that's like, oh, Google, you're terrible. It's like, you shouldn't do this and take away our toys. But you don't tell us what we should change. And we can't really work with that kind of feedback. So make sure that the feedback is something that we can take to the team and say, Look, look at this smart person here with this uh, smart piece of feedback around their specific use case. Makes total sense. We should make sure that this works. Uh, so that's kind of what we would like. Hey, uh, follow up on the uh, some, some schema that Google used. Some pe 
a schema they don't. So uh, we know that uh, a lot of uh, the SEO skills that suggestion to use organization markup, but I know it is not in the markup that's in the development um, uh, a guide. So is that is Google actually use it, or is that any benefit? And also generally, uh, if there is some schema markup in the uh, schema.org website, but it's not listing in the Google Developer Guide, can it be benefit in any way in SEO specifically? Yeah, so that's, I, I think, one of the yeah. trickier questions uh, with regards to all of the structured data in that we we have a lot of things that we use to try to understand the page and the content on the page that we don't necessarily show directly in the search results. So in, in the rich results test, we focus on the things that actually have direct visible effects or can have direct visible effects. Um, but a lot of things help us to better understand the content and the context of a particular page. And uh, those are things within kind of like this general schema.org markup, which you can do various things. And that's kind of, I, I'd say, almost a shame that we don't highlight that in the rich results test. Uh, but it's also something where it's very easy to go overboard, because there are just so many different things you can mark up with schema.org. And you can spend a lot of time marking up all of those individual elements. And there's, there's like absolutely zero effect on your search results, even if we were to process that. So if, if there are things where you feel we, we desperately need to understand the relationships of the items on your page is a little bit better, then like, go ahead and add that markup to the page. Uh, but if it's just like, oh, there are five different types of schema.org that could apply to this page, therefore I'll mark it up, that's probably not providing any value. So a really common use case is to mark a page as a web page. Like we, we do that on the Google.com homepage as well. And so it's not like us making fun of everyone else, but it's something where as a search engine, you look at that web page and it's like, it's a web page, and it says it's a web page. What what else could it be? Uh, it, it doesn't give us any extra value. Uh, so finding things that are really high level important for your pages and adding the markup for that, even if it's not visible, I think that's perfectly fine. Going overboard and just adding all types of markup that you can find, that's like it's not going to harm your site, but it's it's kind of a waste of time. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Hey, uh, John, um, I have a quick uh, mobile first indexing related question for you. Sure. I've got a moment. So uh, I manage a lot of sites. They're in the mobile first index. Uh, and generally, they get crawled at about 90% mobile, maybe 10% desktop crawler. Uh, one of the sites, uh, and again, it's, it's an adaptive uh, platform rather than fully responsive. So there are some differences. I have one site in particular, it's my larger sites, uh, that's getting crawled about 40% desktop, 60% uh, mobile. Is that a, does that create problems? Is that, I mean, I, it is, again, it is in the mobile first index. Uh, is that a bad thing? Is that something I should be working to fix? Is, can you explain a little bit about that? I, I don't think that would be a sign of a bad thing. My, my hunch is that it depends a little bit on the type of content that you have on the site. Um, so for, for example, I'm not sure if for, for Google Shopping we would use the, the smartphone Googlebot or if we'd use a des desktop Googlebot. So if it's, if it's an e-commerce site that's visible in Google Shopping, and we crawl kind of shopping results with the desktop Googlebot, then you'll probably see more crawls with the desktop Googlebot in a case like that. I'm not 100% sure if that's the case with shopping. Uh, it might also be similar with uh, kind of the ads bot, the landing page check, uh, those kind of things. Uh, but depending on the type of content, we might be using slightly different requests on our side to crawl the site, and that could result in a slightly different skew of desktop versus mobile uh, when it comes to the overall crawling when you look at your log files. Cool. Thank you. Follow up on e-commerce e very quick. Just uh, so so uh, Martin a while ago, Martin said that uh, Google Merchant Center bots don't render JavaScript. So in that case, if I um, switch my product page to uh, schema markup from HTML based to JavaScript, will it still be able to show up in rich resulting shopping 
um, related term? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, what specifically Martin said there. I, I would check with Martin, especially when it comes to rendering. He, he knows everything there. I, I see. Thanks. I actually already asked him, but he, but he don't know an, uh, anything about Martin Center. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> OK. Yeah. So I, I think everything around shopping is something that is, is kind of sneaking up on us uh, on, on the web search side, because a lot of the shopping things are now kind of being merged a little bit within the organic search results. And they're no longer kind of this separate paid experience. Uh, so I imagine over time, we, we'll have a little bit more information to, to share around that. OK, thank you. Cool. OK, we didn't get through like a ton of questions. But uh, if there's anything in, in the questions that you really need to have answered, feel free to drop that into the next Hangout. Um, I, I need to jump off to, to another meeting. So I can't stick around a little bit longer. But maybe, maybe on Friday, we'll have a bit more time. Um, thank you all for joining in. Thanks for all of the fantastic questions from you all. Uh, I hope you found this useful. And uh, hopefully, we'll see each other again in one of the future Hangouts. Thanks, Bye, John. everyone. Thank you, John. Bye. Sure. Thank you. Thanks.